my saw was broken. So I was using an M16 that day and I don't have M16 uh, a rig set up for that and for holding magazines like that. I'm a saw gunner, so I have these big pouches. And so they were big linked rounds. And so I was putting magazines in my pockets and putting them up underneath sandbags that we had. So as I'm you know, looking at the rear, there's these sandbags and they got magazines. And so I can kind of reload like this. That's the idea. And I also, I'm up there with D. Dora, D's over here to my right. And we have some rocks that we put up there because we're messing with Davis because Davis is driving the LT's track and he's upset that he has to drive. And he's not normally the... Well, he is sometimes. Man, I don't remember who normally was the LT. No, the, I mean, the LT, Mac would be driving for the LT. Lots of different people drove for the LT. No, but Davis didn't want to. He was in my squad and he didn't like it. And because he wanted to hang out with the boys, right? With us and be throwing rocks at everybody else. But right now we're throwing rocks at him, right? And messing with him. And so we're driving on the road and we're throwing rocks at him and messing with him. And you could see he was smiling. So at least we were, you know, it was, it was a nice last memory, really, because immediately as we're throwing rocks, uh, as his vehicle got on the road and was following us, it just blew up. The whole thing, uh, you know, right in my face, maybe 50 meters away, closer than that, I think, uh, 30. Um, I don't really remember how close it was, but I remember, and I don't remember hearing anything either, but I remember seeing the, uh, uh, it was just like this giant, poof, just dis it just disappeared, and it was like this massive blast shock, and then everything just went slow motion. And I just remember... Giant chunks of earth, the size of vehicles flying in the air. I remember seeing what I thought, what I think was the engine block just floating over my head. And I remember seeing the Mark 19 flying too. So I remember making out a couple things that I recognized, but uh, it was all kind of slow motion and I, you know, just froze up. And I'm just kind of shocked about that I'm looking at that, you know, but this is all slow motion. So it's just kind of this weird feeling, right? And you're like, oh, and you just freeze and watch all this stuff. And you're like, wow. And then everything starts coming down and then it starts speeding back up. So everything. And I remember it as it starts coming down. I remember D and I both were screaming IED, IED, right? Like everybody knew it was an IED, but we were making sure that everybody knew what we just saw was clearly an IED. So Everybody's Explosive device. Improvised explosive device. It's so, uh, uh, yeah, it was a bomb underneath the road. Big enough to take out an APC, a personal carrier. It turns out it was 500, we think, we talked to a uh, special forces guy that did the, uh, interviewed us. They, uh, they, it was, they estimated it was about 500 pounds of TNT underneath the road. So what had happened, so it just blew everything to pieces. All up in the air. It was just this huge, of all kinds of stuff in the air. And it all starts coming down. I remember thinking that was a concern. It, the things that were coming down was, a, was the concern, right? So, and that was like in a flash of a second. So I just remember thinking, hey, we need to be aware of these things coming down because here they come. And we're screaming IED, right? And then all of a sudden, the gunfire breaks out. And it's, it, you know, it's suppressive fire um, and you are keeping down the enemy, whoever's amb ambushing us and whatever's going down. Uh, we're going to lay down some rounds and make sure that we're safe for at least for half a second, figure out what's going on. So we light them up everywhere, all directions, 360 degrees, gunfire, 50 cows, 240s, uh, saws, M16s, they all, every direction, man. Oh, just nuts. And just the power of all that going on is is uh so so i see a truck and in my sector where i'm looking there's a white truck and it's maybe 75 meters away uh 50 to 75 and he uh starts driving hauling butt driving on out of here and right and so uh, rules of uh, the roe the rules of engagement are to engage anybody that cuts and runs anybody that that's running that's uh, he's game. That's it. You engage that person. That's everybody. If you think about it, you think about an explosion goes off somewhere. Everybody's running, right? So you think about, you don't you don't have a lot of time to decide if this guy's 
a good guy or a bad guy or anything like that. You just got to move and shoot, really, or or not. Right? Depends on the mission, really. So well, we're shooting, and I'm engaged in this truck. And as I'm shooting, whenever there's an ambush, our vehicle is supposed to take an immediate right. So we take an immediate right, but there's that it drops off, right? The road drops off into this field. So, and I'm going there backwards, right? So as we go down into the field, I get thrown back into the, you know, thrown into the front, back to the front of the Humvee, or the not, we're not Humvee, in the Humvees, we're in tracks, to the to the front of the track, and 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 Ford, he's the 50 cal, and he's just cutting them up. I mean, he's just letting loose on that 50. It's just rocking. There's gunfire everywhere. You can't even think about anything. And I get thrown, and I hit the. And he's standing on a box of ammo, boxes of ammo, and that's what he's standing on. And I hit that, and I smash my head and my back, and I just really impact, and I and my arms come back, and I my rifle's right here, and my finger's still in the trigger because I was shooting right. When I flew back, I find and it was still still in there. And as I landed, my rifle barrels and I fire around, and it, my rifle barrels right next to Sergeant Sandifer's head, it, within inches. I mean, just like a very narrow window that I, you know, almost took his head off. And I just remember freezing again. I was like, oh, you know, oh my goodness! But I missed, and I'm like, you know, thank you, God. And then I had to get back up, and the vehicle's moving around. There's all this chaos going on. I, I got to get up, right? So I get up, and I jump back to where I'm at, and there's that vehicle still there. So I can still hit him, right? We just did some maneuvers, but we can still hit him. And I'm and I'm hitting him, and I'm engaging this truck, and and D over here, and I'm firing so fast. That I'm 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 reloading and dropping magazines, but I don't have any magazines. I forget about the ones in my pocket. The ones that were up here on top, there have been, you know, thrown around and gone. So I don't have any ammo. But Sergeant Sanders is over here, and so I'm grabbing ammo off his chest, and I'm reloading off of him, and I'm firing, and I'm and I remember and D's over here to my right, and he just is some switches on his mind and he met he throws up his hands and he goes i quit he's screaming i quit um you know it sounded like what i was just shocked that he was doing this with his hands in the air of all things puts his hands he's got and he's a saw gunner he needs to be letting it loose right now but he didn't want to fight you know and i i was i'm sure i'm peppering him with all my brass right i'm hitting him just covering him with hot brass as i'm firing and uh, and so he's putting his hands in the air and he's saying, I quit, I quit as if he had a choice in the matter. Like, really, you know, like, it's not like you can quit. This is, you know, you're heavily engaged and for, it's not like a video game, right? The idea here is that he seemed like he could just quit. Like, all right, take a break. It's like, you know, why would you even think that? I don't know. So he must have something at least for that second. And I remember turning to my right and, and shaking him. And I'm shaking it, and I'm grabbing him by his chest here, uh, his, his, his uh, chest plate, right? And I'm grabbing the chest plate, and I'm shaking it. And and he's screaming, and I'm screaming, looking dead at him and screaming and telling him, you need to get it together. Get it together. And I'm hollering at him, and I'm telling him, you need to engage. These, you need to shoot. You need to fire. You need to at least, I mean, you need to snap out of it is what we're saying here. You need to snap out of it. And I was afraid of getting shot from his area because he wasn't covering. covering it. I don't know if that's maybe people were shooting. No, I don't know what was going on. There was so, so many crazy. It was so crazy. You didn't have time to figure it out. You just had to act, you know, and he wasn't doing what he needed to do. So I felt threatened. Right. So I was even more double stressed out because I'm like, oh, great. And he's in my squad. Right. And he's in my team. I'm Bravo team leader and he's in my team. And I'm like, my guys, you know, lost it. He's shell shocked. He's shot. So, so we're driving, and all of a sudden, uh, the 50 cal stops, and the and with the vehicle stops, and, and somebody hollers out, you know, we gotta dismount, and we gotta grab this prisoner. And Ford's screaming and hollering, he's over here by this shack. He went over there, and I'm all over it. And I remember running out the back of that track, saying to myself, this dude's dead. As soon as I see this guy, it's done. You know, this is his last this is his last day here. And I go hunt for him. 
And there's that shack. I see the shack. And so I'm running over there. And I get close to the shack and I and I'm kind of walking around the edge and I see and I'm and I'm and I'm getting ready to fire on this guy. I got my finger on the trigger and I and I now can see a, a personage there low and there's by it's by the water. You these rivers right there. And these shacks would typically be scattered on these rivers. They're pumped houses and stuff. And so so I come around the corner and with the intent to kill right now. And as I look around the corner, ready, ready to fire, I see the guy and he's on his knees and he's crying. And immediately I had this feeling that said, stop, you know, or, you know, not to do it, but I wanted to do it. And I purposefully had to say, you're going to go through with this. And Sergeant Perkins runs right in front of me at that very second, right when I had the, enough time for me to have the thoughts and think it and make a choice. And then I felt bad afterwards because I felt now I think about it, I think God was maybe like, that was a test or maybe something, and I failed that one. But he saved me by putting Sergeant Perkins, because obviously I'm not going to kill Sergeant Perkins. And it's like, whoo! Drop my rifle, and uh, Sergeant Perkins grabs that guy. And so we detain him. I, I'm, I'm the one searching him, and he's got these, they have really loose clothing on, uh, real thin fabric. You can feel into the body real easily. You can, it's really easy to check somebody. And he had maybe had a wallet and probably not much more than that. I don't think he had shoes or anything like that on. But I'll tell you the story about the socks here. And um, and so I, I zip tie his hands together, right? Zip tie his hands, put a burlap sack bag over his head, right? And stick him in the back of the track. I remember telling him too, hey, bud, you are lucky to be alive because I almost killed you. 30 seconds ago, you know, type thing. I was talking to him and he didn't understand English, but that's what, you know, it's a weird conversation. So we get in the vehicle and we're supposed to drive back to where we had originally got ambushed and everybody has a platoon, all the vehicles gathered back because everybody scattered and did what they were supposed to do for, for an immediate um, response to an ambush, right? So now we're gathering back and we're going back to this, the road uh, and we're the and we stop the vehicle. We drop the ramp, and Sergeant Perkins and Ford and Oton and who you know they go off and do whatever they're going to do. And I, but I got D with me, and we're going to run over here and create a perimeter and lay down right on this sector because because that was what we we're supposed to do. We we're supposed to set up a perimeter. So we went out there and we waited. And, and I remember D, I remember. Telling D that he needed to get down. You know, we needed because he was kind of standing up, looking around like this, and I'm like, man, we just got ambushed right now, and we don't know what's going on. And he's still in a daze. But you're standing up like a giant target, you know, a uh, big old black man in a green field type thing. It's like, get down, D. Come on, man. And so he gets down, and we're out there. And then finally, uh, QRF, Quick Reaction Force. The, you know, they're the ones that show up whenever there's you know, somebody that needs to be there, that's QRF. And so they show up and we've sometimes a QRF, so we we'll always rotate, right? So these, this time it was like Apaches or I don't know who it was, but some guys roll up and some, some infantry guys come up. So M1 Abrams tank is here, right? So we got some good firepower. We got backup and they come running. There's a couple infantry guys come running out past me and they're like, Hey, you guys can go ahead. You're out of here. We got this from here. And we're like, cool. You know, thanks. And uh, so we walk back and start to gather with our people back at the ambush site to find out what happened, to gather ourselves, to do, you know, you got you to gotta account for all type of sensitive items and personnel and this type of stuff. And, and then we'll go back and go to camp and patch ourselves up. And so I'm walking back and... To, the, to where the, 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 when the explosion happened in the road, I'm, I went and walked to that location. And I wasn't paying attention to my surroundings, really. I was just paying attention to the fact that there was a giant crater in the ground. And a vehicle, a tracked vehicle, was face down, wham, with the tail end of the rear ramp door facing up to the, to the sky, right? And it did a nosedive. And it's buried deep in this hole in the ground. And I'm just like amazed at what I'm looking at. And then 
man, and I don't really remember the timing of the events, but I'm doing my best here. So I remember seeing Mac walking up to me and he's crying. And I remember thinking, and he's dirt, we're all dirty, but I remember looking at the tear marks, trails on his face because of the dirt, right? Because you could see the little trails. And seeing that and looking at him and he's just really emotional and crying, but I don't know what's going on. I have no idea. I'm just kind of like my, I'm still calming down from the adrenaline rush. Like, holy smokes, that whole event was nuts. And I don't know what happened other than I just know the infantry are now here. They're over there. They got a perimeter and we were supposed to gather ourselves. So what's going on? I see Mac over here crying. I'm standing at this giant crater and I'm like, well, what's going on, Mac? And he's like, you know, they're all gone. Kept saying they're all gone and you know, they're all dead. And I'm like, they're all dead. And, and he's like, you know, yeah, it's the LT's track. And I'm like, I'm like, well, no, the track right here is fine. It's beat up in this giant hole, but it's fully armored and it's good, right? They, everybody that was in it had a wake up call when they crashed, right? But the vehicle's in good shape. And he's like, that's the third vehicle. That's the vehicle that after the explosion happened, drove into three. the crater that was made after. So the LT's track was previously, so that was the one that was blown up. And I still didn't, it still didn't really sink in. But it did a little bit, but it just kind of really, I didn't, I said, okay, you know, let me, it didn't, you know, it didn't hit me at once. And I remember looking around and picking up. So we started walking around. We were, so we were walking around and, um, and then I started paying attention to my surroundings and that's, you know, where it was like pieces of metal, chunks of metal scattered everywhere and they're all fizzing and smoking right so it's like it like this smoke everywhere so like you're walking through hell or something and there's all these smoke clouds or you know columns coming up from everywhere right and then there's pieces of flesh and body parts little chunks of them and then there's little chunks of debris and dirt and clods and everything and no matter where you stepped you were stepping on something Everywhere it was completely covered with something. And, you know, and I remember picking up, I picked up a 240. And it was a gun. It was a 240 rifle and it was cut like butter, cut right in half. And I was picking up, and I don't remember if it was the, I think it was the barrel part, the front end, the upper. But I'm holding this cut in half 240 rifle. And I immediately start thinking about Kronfeld and my buddy Kronfeld. And well, I'll tell you him, he's got shrapnel on his neck and he didn't get a purple heart till years later and stuff like that. We'll get into that. And, and he was my buddy and I loved him. I, I, we always butted heads, but I loved him. And I, and he's a 240 gunner. And I thought it was him. I thought it was him. And then I remember when I was picking up more stuff, I found, Rainey's name tag ripped clean off his uniform. All the stitching was gone. It was just completely ripped clean as if all the threads had been removed perfectly so you could just see just the material that was written on Rainey and no th crazy loose threads or nothing. And it was just, and I'm looking at this thing and then I realize it's Rainey. It was Rainey that had gone, right? But it didn't really, it, but that didn't really sink in. And so I had to make the, I started picking up these piles of stuff. And I, you know, it's, it's standard operating procedure to pick up your stuff, you know, uh, your sensitive items that you don't want, you know, so uh, paperwork and equipment and stuff like that. And then obviously body parts, that's, you know, personnel. We got to take that with us too. So I'm starting to, okay, I've got to make piles. I have to. You know, I'm going to make a pile for paper. I'm going to make a pile for um, metal parts, you know, firearms or, or chunks of whatever, you know, hardware. And then another one for flesh and bone and stuff. And I was doing this and I was, I started to have an issue with my fingers getting sticky and getting dirt and crap on it. And I'm picking up papers and now the blood and the dirt 
I was getting on the papers, and so I feel like I'm making a mess. And I'm a, and I'm a combat lifesaver, so you know uh, I got a bunch of you know plastic gloves. Um, for that's like a step down from a medic, so it's like medical stuff. So I have a bunch of gloves, and and I'm thinking I should put my gloves on because it was just becoming an issue. But it, at this point, it was already just such a mess. It didn't really matter. You know, wipe your hands off and. And at that point, I just remember saying, I'm not doing this anymore. And I walked away. And then I remember seeing, and the Mac was right. And then I saw Mac again, and we were hugging and crying or something. And then Kronfeldt starts walking towards us. And I had forgot about picking up Rainey's thing. But it just dawned on me that Kronfeldt's alive. And, and, I, and I don't remember if I told Mac or not, but we all ran to him. And we're just hugging on him and loving. He's crying. Right. And we're just telling him you know, he, he was trying to talk to us and say, you know, they're dead. And he was like in that state. But we were in the opposite state. We we're just happy he was alive. So we we already knew other people were dead. It wasn't him. Right. So we're like, it's not you. You're alive. And then I remember D running over and saying, hey, uh, Davis is part of his body is moving. Y you know, he, maybe he's considered alive or not. Do you want to see him? You know, and I said, no, man, I don't want to see him. I didn't want to remember him that in that state. At, our, at this point in the game, I, had our, I, was, I was aware that I needed to watch what I started to put in my mind. I needed to be aware of, of, of what I invite into my memory and stuff like that. So at this point, I said, I don't want to have that memory. So I'm not going to choose to do that. And it's okay. And, and... And then, and then at some point, here comes Sergeant Fisher. Oh, and then I, re oh, so, so when I, when, when I walked away from the piles that I was making, when I got up, I was in a daze. I was just in an emotional state, uh, but it was in a state of almost like, I felt like I turned the switch. Like I said, I don't care. But when I was saying, I don't care about this, walking away, I was like trying to tell myself, it's, you know, I don't care, I guess, or, or, Block it out. It's fine. Drive on. Like we're good. Everybody's fine. We're good, right? But I was dragging my rifle behind me, and you don't drag your rifle. And I had seen in Black Hawk, which we already got that one done, you know, another young gentleman dragging his rifle, and I thought, low, bad of him. And now here I am. I'm the one doing the same thing. And and people were looking at me with compassion, and I'm the one that's you know. Guys are okay. The guys in the tank, yeah, then the uh, yeah, in the tank. And then when the TC and the driver, they're up here and they're looking at me and they're really sad. You could tell they were sad, looking at me. I don't know how sad I looked, but they were. I looked at them and I said, "Oh man, those guys are sad." But I'm dragging my rifle, and so I and, and as I realized this, I grab my rifle and get back in the game. And so I said, "Okay, we're back together." Got my composure up, and then here comes Fish Sergeant Fisher running. He's a second platoon medic, and he comes running. And he wants to, he's screaming at me, trying to get me to say, hey, and he's like, you know, Simmental, Simmental, Ford's over here, uh, and he's threatening to kill the, the prisoner that we got. And because, so Ford and I are the same squad, I'm Bravo team leader, he's Alpha team leader, so we work together as team leaders, and he figures that I would be the best person to stop Ford from killing this man. But you my tell the story, the part about fixing the socks, too. Oh. So you need to back up to... Yeah, I need to tell that. Okay. You had him in the... So before I get to what happened with Ford and the prisoner, so the prisoner, so when we were driving back, well, after I detained the prisoner, so go back, rewind it a little bit, after we go re detained the prisoner, I was really paranoid that he was going to somehow, even though I checked him myself, I was somehow, I was paranoid that somehow he was going to, if he had some type of razor or knife or, or nail or blade underneath his tongue, somehow I missed, or in between is, you know, tucked up somewhere, that he would have some type of means to, to threaten me and basically cut me. I was, I was afraid he was going to get me in my groin, in my femora already right in here somewhere. And I, it was just driving me crazy. And... <clears throat> So I go, I'm just going to knock this guy out so I don't have to worry about this. He's 
his, his, his duct, you know, his, his, his head is covered in a burlap sack. He can't see anything. His hands are securely tied. I can see it, right? And he doesn't really look like a threat. I'm just scared. But I'm about to knock him out. So in my fear, I'm about to act out. As I'm sizing up the situation and how I'm going to knock him out and how this is going to go. Because I'm trying to – D's already flipped out on me once. He's already – he's already – I don't trust that anybody's watching our rear, basically. I'm the one that needs to do it. But I got to deal with this. So – and all this going on. So I was super stressed out, right? So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to knock this guy out. As I'm looking down, <laughs> I see him with his feet fiddling, fidgeting with these, these socks that he's wearing. And the socks that he's wearing are too small for his feet. And they're like children's socks, right? And immediately my heart gets softened right away. And I start thinking, my goodness, either this guy is just so in poverty, this is all he can afford and he wants to save his socks because this is the best pairs of socks he's got. Or that it was his daughter's socks and that maybe he thought he was going to die and that he was trying to hold on to the last thing he cherished. Or something like that. So I drop down and I get down and I tell him, you know, tell him that it's going to be okay. I have a tendency of telling everybody it's going to be okay. I guess that's a that's a quality problem. That's a good one, right? But I think I was telling this guy, Haji, and uh, he doesn't understand English, but telling him it's going to be all you know, tell him, hey, it's going to be all right, bud. And I was holding his foot. And I was caressing his foot and I'm dirty and sweaty and nasty and everything, his feet are and everything. But I remember just holding on to his foot and I was really trying to hold on to his foot with love. And if I could do anything good at that moment, it was just to hold his foot the right way. And it was just a second. It was only just a second. But I held his foot and I, you know, Put up his socks the best I could, kind of secured him best I could to get. Hold, I was trying to help him out, help him, help this man with him sock with his socks. And I get back up, and no big deal. And then so we move, continue on the mission. So now fast forward back to, I've already been walking around. I realized my buddies are dead. It still hasn't really sunk in yet, but I'm just kind of walking. And so here comes Sergeant Fisher running over to me, and he's saying, Simmental, you got to stop Ford from shooting this Haji in the face over here." And I remember saying, you know, if he shoots him, he shoots him. I don't really care. And I remember turning my back to him and walking away and then looking back over there. And I could see the prisoner, the same prisoner I had on his knees crying, you know, or something. And Ford over with his pistol screaming at him. Ah! And, and he didn't shoot him. And I'm glad he didn't. But uh, I'm sure there were people that wanted him to shoot him. There were people that didn't want him to die because there's at this point there's a lot of people there, and then we we got together and we all went back to camp, and as a platoon we all prayed and I don't remember who prayed but I do remember I thought it was Sergeant Dosh but maybe um, I just remember seeing Sergeant Dosh because I just had a problem with authority in general all the time you know, and he was my platoon sergeant and I have a lot of respect for military personnel but at this point in the game I was a seasoned combat vet. And I wasn't impressed by nobody, really. We got to talk about the milk story, too. I mean, that, at least that was the state of mind I was trying to put myself in at the time or, or be in or whatever, or that I was in. And I just remember seeing him just cry. We all knelt and prayed. We lost Carr, our medic, Mitchell, Rainey, Davis, and the LT. And, and it was a sad day, man. But those guys are heroes.